Welcome to worship with the Universalist Unitarian Church of Peoria. My name is Carol Manning. I have the pleasure of leading the service today with our member, Mary Keister. Mary is the founder of Fat Girls in Fiction. She is an author and an activist doing work in body positivity and fat liberation. Her main focus is to find and create more positive representation of people living in larger bodies. So today, we the members and friends, children and youth of this congregation strive to live into our mission of embracing freedom, loving inclusively, growing in mind, body and spirit, and adding to the health and wholeness of the world. In living our mission, we are mindful of those who came before us. This is the ancestral home of the Peoria people. They aided the European settlers who came down the Illinois River. We offer our respect to the Peoria people for who they were in the past and who they are today. For those of you who are new to the congregation, thank you for joining us. Today, visiting a religious community, whether in person or online, is a leap of hope in the search for meaning and connection, and we are glad you are here. After service today, please join us for coffee hour and our discussion group, at everyone is welcome, will meet at 11.50. If you could just turn off your phone, and by the way, we are so happy to have Rosa back today. And please stand as you are able and let us sing hymn number 159. This is my story. Opening today is by Ian Riddell. Come one, come all. Come with your missing pieces and your extra screws. Come with your hard edges and your soft spots. Come with your bowed heads and upright spines. Come all you flamboyant and drab, verbose and quiet, fidgeting and lethargic. All you with large vision and tender hearts, all you with small courage and tender fears, bring your lisp and your stutter and your song, bring your gravel and your drawl and your lilt, 
Bring your anger and your joy and your righteous indignation. Misfits and conformists and everyone in between, come into this space and be welcome. Bring who you are. Bring where you've traveled, bring what you long for, and let us worship together. The chalice lighting is by Deborah Burrell. Fire consumes and casts a bright light. May our chalice flame consume our regrets for the past, our fears for the future, and our worries about today. May it light for us a path of joy and peace. All right, I will um, invite the young children to come up. I'm going to read a book that I think everyone will get a little something from today. Okay, all right. I am reading a book called uh, Beautifully Me by Nabella Noor. All right, I'm just going to read it here so I can get the microphone. Okay. Beautifully me. Salam, my name is Zubi Chowdhury. Yesterday I woke up before the sun. I knew it was going to be a special day because it was my first day of school. I put on my blue overalls and my pink shirt with the fancy puffy sleeves. Amma had made it just for me in Bangladesh. I twisted my hair into two pigtails and my lucky butterfly clips and slid on my bangles. I ran to my parents' room to show them my first day outfit. Baba was helping Amma wrap in her yellow sari, her body, to wrap her sari around her body. She looked so beautiful, like sunshine and mangoes. Oof, Mama said, look at this tummy. I'm getting too big. Why was Amma sad? Good morning, Daddy Ma. My big sister, Maya, buzzed into the kitchen like a busy bee. Can I have oatmeal instead, Daddy Ma? Oatmeal? Maya hates oatmeal. Why don't you want any of the parafas we made for you, Daddy Ma asked. My tummy cheered as I smelled the flaky, buttery bread in front of me. How could she say no to parafas? Maya shrugged. I'm on a diet. I want to lose weight so I can look pretty at the school dance. Naya was the most beautiful person I know. She's funny and smart and sweet as Lavados. That's my favorite dessert. Why would she say she's not pretty? Should I go on a diet too? Baba popped his head in and jingled his keys. Girls, let's get ready to go. Why haven't you worn the shirt I bought for you, Eid? Daddy Ma asked Baba. Baba laughed and patted his belly. I've put on some weight. I'm too large now. That's not good. Why is large not good? I grabbed my backpack and I gave my kitten Kofi a big kiss and I rushed out the door. My teacher is amazing. We did crafts and learned new songs and went to the library before lunchtime. I even made a new friend. Her name is Karima. At recess, some of the kids hopped like bunnies, some raced like race cars, some climbed up to the sun. Alex, you look fat in that dress. Alex looked beautiful in their dress. It shined like the sun. But Kennedy doesn't sound like she's giving a compliment. Why is looking fat bad? Do I look fat in my overalls? When we got home from school, Amma was there waiting for me. How was your first day, Zuby? I thought about what had happened. Um, it was fine. Amma spent the rest of the afternoon cooking. Daddy Ma was helping to chop vegetables. The house smelled delicious. When we sat down for dinner, 
I was so excited to eat the kava. No rice for me, thanks, Amma, Naya said. No rice? Oh, yeah, I forgot. Naya is on a diet. I thought about large not being good. I thought about Amma and Naya and Alex. If they're not beautiful, how could I be? Maybe I need to change too. Sudan John, don't you want your rice and chicken? It's your favorite, Amma said. No, I'm on a diet. A diet? Amma looked confused. Zubi, you shouldn't be on a diet. Naya said you have to be on a diet to be pretty, and I want to be pretty. Why would you think that, Zubi? You are beautiful. But you told Baba your tummy was too big, and you were sad. And Baba said large is not good. And then at recess, Kennedy teased Alex for looking fat in their dress. And I don't want kids to make fun of me, too. I ran to my room and shut my door. My heart felt like crying. Maybe it wasn't a special day as I thought. Zubi, Baba said, sometimes when people are feeling sad and hurting inside, they make other people feel the same. That might be why Kennedy said that to your friend. I never thought about why someone would be mean. But sometimes we can be mean to ourselves without even realizing it. And when we hurt ourselves, we hurt the people we love and the, and the ones who love us. And we did that to you today, Zubi, and we are sorry. Yes, said Amma, you saw me being unkind to my tummy, but I am grateful for my belly. After all, it carried you and brought you into the world. I'm sorry too, said Naya. It's hard not to compare myself to others, but I'd rather be me, your sister, than anybody else. Do you know why we named you Zubi? Amma asked. I shook my head and sniffled. We named you Zubi because it means loving and understanding. And we knew that you would make the world more beautiful just by being Zubi. I didn't know my name means beautiful, I admitted. You get to define what is beautiful. Whatever your body looks like, beauty is how you make people feel and the kind things you do for them. A beautiful person is someone who embraces who they are and helps others to do the same. There is only one Zubi, and that makes you beautifully you. I can make the world more beautiful? Yes, Zubi Jean. Then you are all beautiful, I told Amma and Naya and Baba, just the way you are, and I gave them a big hug. Thanks for reminding us of that, Naya whispered to me. Later, Amma tucked me in bed and kissed me goodnight. Through the window, the moon and the stars smiled down. Everything was beautiful. It was a special day, after all. All right. So that's the story for today. And if you guys want to go to... So I think you're walking in the woods today, so go find Cindy and she'll help you. Thank you, Mary, for that story. The offering today, I read something by Victoria Weinstein. The purpose of the church is to encourage all who gather there to grow more generous in spirit and in action. This is the great end of all the world's faith traditions, to bring the human being closer to the divine by acts of creation and compassion 
we now take an offering that allows us to exercise that all-important generosity of spirit. After the ushers pass the plate, Rosa will play music. This is a time to let your mind and heart be visible um, and known with the tangible act of lighting a candle if you wish. The gifts of the congregation will be most gratefully received. Ours is a welcoming community where we find connection, a spiritual community where we find meaning. We have a sharing community where our joys are amplified and our sorrows are lessened. We take this moment to reflect on our joys and sorrows and acknowledge the mutual support of the community. So this week I had no sorrows, which is pretty great. But no joy, so as you know, I bring my own. So I want to offer up words of joy for this amazing weather and wonderful friends to share it with. And um, it, we had a great start Thursday night for a new members class. We're out on the patio. It was wonderful. I'm offering that up. It's just something I'm so happy about. I'm grateful that Reverend Jennifer is back in one piece. <laughs> And I'm really grateful for all the support I've gotten all summer. I want to thank you all. So may we remember those whose names we have spoken as well of, as those we hold in silence in our hearts. Let's so just take a moment of silence. All right, start with a reading called Feel That. 
by Gwen Matthews. Feel that? Each breath, every inhale, exhale, we are living, breathing, connected. We are a whole, complete, beautiful selves that we were born to be. Feel that in your bones, in your muscles, in your heart and your blood. That is extraordinary you. That you were born this time, this place, this moment. Feel that? The struggle, the worry, the pain, the loss, the grief. It's still you. You are still whole, complete, beautiful, and extraordinary. Feel that. All right. So before I start, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping and let you know a few things. I am going to use the word fat. I know that word sometimes rubs people the wrong way and has caused a lot of harm for people over the years. But I use it in a way to reclaim it as the neutral description that it is of a body. It holds no morality. It is mere description. So that's why I use that word. And also, I'm going to refer to myself as fat. And I don't need you to be like, oh, you're not fat. Don't speak, hard. don't speak of yourself like that. Clearly, I am fat. And I am OK with that because it is a neutral description of the body I live in. And I love the body I live in. So just wanted to clear that up going forward. <sighs> All right. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about the body positivity movement and fat liberation and how I came to be a part of this movement and the work that I do with it. Um, I became aware of the body positivity movement probably about 10 years ago. And I knew that it was important because I had a daughter and I knew what growing up in a fat body had meant for me. And I wanted to kind of shake off some of the shame so that she wouldn't have to have that same experience. So we know the diet culture industry is everywhere. You can't go to the store, turn on your TV, talk to friends and family without hearing about the diet that they're on or seeing some fad workout video or all of these things that just serve to remind you that you're not enough and that people, <laughs> there's an entire industry set up so that people don't look like you. And that doesn't feel very good. <laughs> Um, and I just, I wanted to be able to tell my daughter that these things aren't important, but you can tell her all you want. And it isn't the best way I have learned is by modeling. So I couldn't tell her to love herself. I had to love myself. I couldn't tell her your body is beautiful while hating my own. So that is how I came to start this work that I do. And now when we think of it, we think of the diet culture and, that is, and the bullying and those things, they're very evident. But what we don't see is just the pervasive way it seeps into every aspect of our culture. Growing up, I thought really hard about, when, when doing this, I was thinking about fat representation I saw on TV and in the books I read. There's not much. I thought about Augustus Gloop from in the chocolate factory. That is a moral telling, telling you that you are fat because you chose to live in a way that caused that. And that's not how fatness works. And then I also thought about the Dursleys from Harry Potter. Their fatness is used as shorthand to tell you that these characters are greedy and lazy and slovenly. It's it's shorthand to tell you bad characteristics. And that's the fat representation I grew up with. So it's hard to find value in yourself when subliminally and not subliminally you're sent, you're sent messages that there's something wrong with you and you did it to yourself. And that's, that's what we go through living life in a fat body. So I knew that I needed, I needed to change that and I needed to work on myself Number one, for myself to heal myself, but also I was most called to do it for my daughter. And when you're thinking of these stories, society is telling you something. They're telling you 
Who deserves a happy ending? And you see those happy endings given to a straight-sized um, cis-het white women. Like that's, that's who society has decided deserves happy endings. When you think back to all of the rom-coms, all of the fantasies, like everything, that's who's getting the happy endings. And that's a message. And we need to really work to change that. And that's why I'm about to tell you about a book that I found so profoundly moving because it, it pushed up against that message and said, of everyone is deserving of a happy ending. Okay, I lied. There's one more bit of housekeeping I'm gonna do. I'm gonna talk about this book, spoiler alert. Uh, be aware if you're interested, it is an adult romance novel. So 18 plus, consenting adults doing what consenting adults do. If you're not interested in reading that, then skip it. Like, <laughs> I'll just tell you that going in. Um, but yeah, and now you might be going, her life was changed by a romance novel? It was, which <laughs> is, is an interesting thing in and of itself. I had never read a romance novel. I was somewhat an avid reader my entire life, but I had always read mostly fantasy, some mystery, but I never really got into romance. And then I read this one because there's an aspect of fan fiction and being a lover of fantasy, I as well love fan fiction. So I was like, and then I saw this beautiful fat woman on the cover and I was like, all right, I'm gonna give it a go. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of a brief synopsis just so that you can kind of know where we're going. This, um, this woman posts a picture on Twitter of herself in cosplay. And the, triddle, tr the Twitter trolls come out to play and say they mean nasty comments. And the star of the show, which is like a Game of Thrones style TV show, like comes to her defense and is like, she is beautiful, leave her alone. And ends up asking her on a date to kind of keep the Twitter trolls at bay. And in doing that, they find out that he as well writes fan fiction and they are online best friends and a cute rom-com ensues. So right, fine, that's a great romance plot, but that doesn't sound life-changing. Here's where it comes in. I, for the first time in reading this book, saw a confident fat woman owning herself and her body, and it wasn't about weight loss. It wasn't about her learning to love herself. She had done all that work, and she knew her worth. And it was the first time I'd ever read that. And... So when I read that, I was like, I need to read more books like this. So I went searching. And let me tell you, they are really hard to find. <laughs> There's just not many of them. And um, so I, I, I've been searching for those. And um, this book also validated feelings that I would have living in a fat body. Things people would say to you and... Just things that you, you try, but let it go. They don't know that that was offensive. You spend so much of your life as a fat person trying to let those things go. So I'm going to read to you a little section in this book. And this is a section when she calls out to her writing community and says, these things are harmful. And here's why. So I'm going to read you a little bit. <laughs> All right. I think I desperately needed to read and watch a story of how a woman most considered homely and downright hideous could earn respect and admiration and eventually find love in the man she desired and loved herself. I needed to witness her character, her choices, and how her words would come to mean more than him in the end than that the world would not call her pretty. I wanted that because of my history my family history, my romantic history. I can't tell you how many times a date or a boyfriend or someone I considered a friend has shamed me for my size. They sometimes do it directly, but more often they're subtle ways or ways they don't consider at all. They do it by urging me to walk, work out or take a walk every time I'm with them or by discussing their ostensible concern for my health or by pushing me towards what they consider more nutritionally sound food choices. 
but I'm not looking to be fixed. I want to be loved and liked and desired, not because of my size, not despite my size, but because I'm me, my character, my choices, my words. Each time someone I cares about show that they don't care about me in the same way it hurts. That is why this community is important to me. That is why it's painful when stories come out of our community using fatness as shorthand for greed, for ugliness, for laziness. Now to be clear, I don't think fat shaming is usually a conscious choice in our fix. Hatred of fatness and disdain towards fat people is widespread in our culture. It comes out in ways we don't intend. And I include myself in that statement. Being fat does not absolve me of, um, being fat does not exempt me from having to consider my words and actions thoughtfully when talking about fatness. I'm not asking you to celebrate my fatness. I'm only asking that you be thoughtful when you reference it and think, would this hurt my friend? And if the answer is yes, then please reconsider. Now, when I read that, it, it does make you think of all of those times people have said innocuous statements to you that they, they don't see as harmful, but they are because they're calling attention to the fact that something, they, they perceive something to be wrong with your body, knowing nothing of your health, of your background, just what they see. And that can lead to a lot of really harmful systemic forms of oppression. Okay. Sorry, I just lost my spot in reading the book. Okay, so before and after, these are some things that are also harmful that I don't think people realize. There are things like before and after pictures. You, you don't see that as being harmful because you're like, I want to celebrate this accomplishment. But your accomplishment is that you're happy that your body no longer looks like mine. I want to celebrate with you. If you ran a marathon or even walked around the block and you haven't done that before, I as your friend want to celebrate with you. But I don't want to celebrate the fact that you're happy that your body doesn't look like mine anymore. And there are also things like um, complaining that you look fat or feel fat when around an actual fat person because fatness isn't a feeling. Say that you are feeling tired or you're just feeling blah. Don't say you're feeling fat because... That is also one way to remind the, your fat friend that you think there's something wrong with their body. And also, this one is tricky. Doing the work that I do, I am often praised for my confidence of being able to speak about these things so plainly. What you're saying is that you don't think someone in my body should be confident. You don't think someone who looks like me should be brave and confidently speaking. And it kind of hurts. And these things lead to systemic forms of oppression. And by that, I'm talking about um, health. Fat people are often denied care because the doctors think they need to lose weight before they can have that care. And that stems from society viewing fatness coming from laziness or fatness being a moral failing. And so it keeps us from the health care we need. Also, job discrimination. I think the last numbers I think that came out were that fat people make 20% less than their counterparts and are less likely to be given raises and promotions. And that also stems back to the fact that it's seen as a moral feeling and that you have low willpower. And so these, while they seem harmful, have real life implications. And I think it's important to be aware of that. All right, so when I learned these things and read this book and did the work, it kind of did what I called, which was unplugged me from the matrix. And I was able to step back and see, see fat phobia in a different light. 
Now, I'm not saying, I know that some of the things that I've said may make you feel uncomfortable because you may have done these things. But let me tell you, I've done all of these things too. All of them. And never once did I mean to harm anyone. And never once did I think I was harming myself. But when I was able to step back and see it, I, I could see that that was the case. And so, in reading that book, and in my, my one desire to find more, I started making TikToks, like you do these days on social media. And I got out and was making videos of the books I had read that had positive fat representation. And I was overwhelmed with the people who needed these books just as much as I did. The people who needed to see these stories and see themselves getting a happy ending. So that's why I started Fat Girls in Fiction. And Fat Girls in Fiction is a, was a website that serves as a database for people to come and find books with fat representation. And um, there are a couple interesting things I found when doing this work. And that is, if you want me to give you fat recommendations, I can give them to you all day for romance and young adult books. That's about it. I have not yet come across a thriller with a fat main character. I have read a mystery with a fat main character, but then the world around it is so full of harmful fat tropes that I can't, in good conscience, recommend the book. There, I've not found a history that, or history, a horror story that has a fat main character, or that um, they're almost all villains because fatness is used to be a morality. And so I think we need to do a lot of work here. And in the work that I've done, I've spoken on some panels and done some podcasts, and we were able to um, put together an anthology that came out called Curves and Magic, which was a fantasy anthology with short stories. And the book community is receptive to writing better representation, but it's just going to take a while. And it's, it's fulfilling work. And I have loved what I have learned and what I have gained. And the work that I do with fat girls and fiction is fulfilling. But what I am more proud of and what means more to me is, not, is the work that I've been able to do on myself. I have made accomplishments that I am proud of through my speaking, through curating a supportive online community. But I have learned in doing that to be myself and to show up and be seen in a world that would rather not have to perceive me, in a world that would rather shame me and hide me away because they perceive the way I look to be a moral failing on my part. I know now that that's not the case. And that was a very important thing for me to learn. I also now have a daughter who calls out fat phobia. She was never in the matrix. Like she sees it for what it is and calls it out. She doesn't internalize those statements for 40 years like I did. She's able to say that is fat phobic and then it's a you problem, not a me problem. And that, that makes me so happy that I'm able to kind of lift the burden for her a little bit. So those are the things that are important to me. So I'll just wrap up by saying this. All bodies are good bodies. Your body is not an equivalence of your character or your morals. Your body is wonderful because it houses the beautiful soul that lives inside of it. I think if we could all remember that, it would bring us just a little more peace. And I'm gonna close by reading the dedication in this book. To everyone who has ever doubted, as I did, someone who looks like you can be desired. Someone who looks like you can be loved. Someone who looks like you can have a happy ending. I swear it.
All right, thank you. All right. And if you will join us in singing number 118, This Little Light of Mine, rise if you can, and we will sing. Is wonderful, Mary. Thank you. By Becky Laurent, as flame is to spirit, so spirit is to breath, and breath to song. Though we extinguish the flame in the sanctuary, may we tend it in our hearts until we meet again. This is by Cynthia Landrum. I, I love this benediction. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection, our concerns, or our care for each other. Our service to each other, to the world, and to our faith continues. Until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true, and be loving. Thank you.